afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to have the opportunity to introduce Duncan Ryukin Williams this afternoon. I've crossed paths with Duncan several times. I first encountered him as a first-year PhD student at Harvard, where Duncan, nearing completion of his own PhD, had a reputation as a star graduate student. Not only was he working on his own dissertation, Duncan was also in the process of finishing a survey and analysis of the dissertations produced in Buddhist studies, which remains a valuable window into the history of our discipline and the type of study that really should be repeated. I next met Duncan in Berkeley at the University of California, where I have a postdoc, and he was gaining a reputation as an institution builder. He continued this at the University of Southern California, where he oversaw the creation of the Shinso Ito Center for Japanese Religions and Culture. And there I waved at him across the miles of eight-lane traffic from my office in West LA. <laughs> uh, even before he completed his PhD, Duncan had co-edited two books, and now you understand why he was the star graduate student. The first, with Mary Evelyn Tucker, is Buddhism and Ecology, there, The Interconnection of Dharma and Zi, published by Harvard University Press. The second, with Christopher McQueen, is American Buddhism, Methods and Findings in Recent Scholarship. Both of these are path-breaking books in Buddhist studies, showing how scholars of Buddhism can and should participate in conversations about ecology and about American religions. These two books were followed by his monograph, The Other Side of Zen, A so Social History of Soto Zen Buddhism in Tokugawa, Japan, published by Princeton University uh, Press. This work opened up new landscapes in the study of Tokugawa Buddhism. More recently, Duncan has co-edited East Bay Buddhism in the Americas and also edited the two-volume set Papa Japan, which explores the global mixed race identities of persons of Japanese descent. These two volumes are supplemented by an online resource the Hapa Japan Project, with news stories, articles, and interviews. His most recent book is American Sutra, A Story of Faith and Freedom in the Second World War. Here, Duncan brings his wealth of knowledge and research acumen to a story that had yet to be fully told, and one with important resonances for our own time. We'll be hearing part of that story today, so without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Duncan Williams. Thank you, Natasha. That makes me sound like significant or something, but it's very uh, much a pleasure of mine to join all of you here, uh, and I appreciate the Department of Religious Studies and uh, uh, for sponsoring this uh, event. I'm, 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 uh, I wanted to maybe start um, today about this new book. It, it, it's, it is about uh, the World War II Japanese American uh, internment or incarceration, uh, but from a new angle, uh, Buddhism. And I'm going to try to get into that a little bit later. But I thought maybe I'd start today uh, by talking about like grad school and, and, and back uh, uh, when I was a PhD student um, uh, at Harvard and, and I was working uh, at that time with uh, one of the really great scholars of, ja uh, of, of Buddhist studies in general, uh, Masatoshi Nagatomi. He was Harvard's first uh, professor in that field, uh, <coughs> hired in 1958. And uh, so you can imagine, I was kind of like at the very tail end of his very long and distinguished uh, career. And this book, American Sutra, about the Japanese American internment and Buddhism, actually has everything to do with uh, my professor and mentor. And it's like, in a way, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book uh, kind of a tribute to him. Uh, so this book, um, and I'm glad so many people turn up because it took me over 17 years to do and kind of suck if nobody came. But uh, <laughs> um, it, it, it's a book that uh, began with this kind of very personal uh, kind of uh, reason. Uh, I was just finishing up, uh, as uh, Natasha mentioned, uh, Professor Hill mentioned, uh, 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 in my PhD program, uh, and, and I, I, I was considering how to you know, proceed in my career as a uh, person that did the history of Japanese Buddhism. And, and, and uh, it would never have occurred to me to do such an extended thing about you know, something like the World War II Japanese American internment. But uh, right after I finished, uh, Professor Nagatomi passed away suddenly. And I was asked to, by his family to perform the memorial service uh, uh, along with a friend of mine, Mark Uno, we, we, we co-officiated um, his service because in my other 
role. I'm, I'm, I'm also a Buddhist, ordained Buddhist priest, and the family asked me to, to, to do something for uh, his remembrance. And in that process, uh, the family also asked me, you know, uh, he passed away suddenly, but he'd always thought that one day he'd like to gift his amazing collection of books in Buddhism. He had everything from Sanskrit and Pali texts to Tibetan and Chinese and Japanese, like, like just a massive collection, that he'd like to donate that to some library in the future. And his office was always this kind of like a really, it's like a old school like office of papers, <laughs> dissertation chapters mixed with books. And it's like mountains everywhere. And I think he had an order to everything, but it, was, it looked a very, disorderly office. So the family asked me, could you go in there and see what is uh, good to give to a gift as a, a donation for a library and what would be good to like pull out of there? He said, they said, anything written like uh, that looks personal, please pull it out because we don't want that to go. So I went in there and I used to do as one of his kind of like teaching assistants and different, I, I would, um, uh, take his Japanese notes. He would write things in Japanese, and then, uh, and then I'd have to kind of type them up, and uh, these be these little notes for for class and st stuff like that. So, I knew what his handwriting looked like, and there was something that had the word Nagatomi in Japanese in it, but I could tell it wasn't his writing. So I pulled it out because I thought this might be one of those personal things I need to pull out, and I started reading it. And I don't know if you can see the screen very well, but. What's on the left here is one page of the document I pulled out. And it was, uh, I would come to learn, uh, not his writing, but his father's writing. And so you can see his father to the right there, Reverend Shinjo Nagatomi, a Buddhist priest who had served uh, before the war uh, at, in San Francisco. At the San, it's called the <coughs> San Francisco Buddhist Church. And after the war in the Los Angeles area at the Gardena Buddhist Temple. And uh, at the time, I started reading it, and the family was like, oh, this is you know, something that's valuable for our family history. Could you uh, translate this diary? And so I started embarking on that, and I figured out that this was written in 1942, 43, 44, uh, behind barbed wire in a camp called Manzanar, one of the uh, big uh, Japanese-American uh, in, in incarceration centers um, in Eastern California. And to my shame, I didn't really, I grew up in, until I was 17 in Tokyo, Japan, and, and uh, I didn't know that much about American, you know, yeah, World War II history and the, that the fact that, you know, roughly, a 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, two thirds of whom were American citizens had been put into these camps like Manzanar, uh, many of them holding a little over 10,000 people each. So there were 10 of these camps. So I didn't know very much and so I, I tried to translate some of these words that are in there like mess hall. I was like, what's a mess hall? And, and it, I wasn't trained in Buddhist studies to know uh, that much about this kind of uh, history. But along the way, and the reason this book took 17 some years is because I had to kind of, I, I kind of dedicated as a constant side project that I would like to uh, not only translate this diary for the family, but also learn enough about it that I could put it, give it some context. And um, so I ended up spending about two or two and a half years in different archives in Washington, D.C. at the National Archives at different kinds of Buddhist archives until I collected you know, thousands and thousands of pages. I began translating this diary and then other families who had you know, a Buddhist uncle or grandfather or who was a, uh, also an ordained priest, they started giving me tr you know, diaries to translate too. So I translated about a do dozen diaries. Um, and then I interviewed about 120 camp survivors, people who had uh, lived through the World War II experience. And that was the basis on which I, I tried to write this book called American Sutra. Now, when I first started translating this thing, I would go to my now uh, deceased uh, pro you know, professor, my mentor's 
uh, with you know, uh, his, his wife, and I would take her a couple pages at a time. And every time I would go, she kind of started to share some of her own personal experience of the World War II period. She was only uh, 10 or 11 years old at the time, and uh, she was, <coughs> unlike my professor who was born in Japan and uh, an originally Japanese national, she was Japanese American. She was born in a uh, small Central Valley, a town uh, in California called uh, Madera, California. Her parents from Wakayama Prefecture in Japan. And she grew up there as a, as a kind of agricultural oriented uh, community and, and a place that uh, had a lot of Japanese Americans doing, doing farming. And so uh, she would slowly relate to me. I think it took like four or five visits before I got the full story. But she basically uh, related the story of what happened to her and her family right after Pearl Harbor and the attack in December 1941. She said that the community that she lived in was on kind of like high alert because a lot of the community leaders were getting kind of picked up by the FBI right after uh, the Pearl Harbor attack. And one day, she comes home from school. It's in the out like three o'clock in the afternoon. She comes home from school and then she sees right at the door of her farmhouse, her dad uh, being beaten by some men in suits. And then she goes closer and sees, peers inside the house, and she sees her mom sitting really still at the kitchen table with somebody sh pointing a shotgun to her mom's head. Now, she's only 10 or, or turning 11, so she, 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 she's uh, quite astonished and scared at what she's seeing, but she realizes very quickly that she needs to approach this situation because her parents, being from Wakama, they didn't speak almost you know, they didn't speak very much English, and uh, clearly these men in suits didn't speak any Japanese. And so she would come to be the translator in this situation, and soon it became apparent that these men in suits were uh, agents from the FBI, and that they had come, they, they told her, that uh, because her dad was on a list, like a national threat security list, because of his leadership, at the local Buddhist temple. And that she was trying to explain to the agents that her dad, you know, unbeknownst to him, he didn't know these agents coming. So he was apparently out in the lettuce field uh, and there's some rabbits or something. He wanted to scare them away. So he had a shotgun and he was kind of like firing it to kind of scare the rabbits away. But that's unfortunately the precise moment when the FBI cars rolled in to the farm. So there's like, like a lot of confusion. And so she had to kind of clarify for them uh, what was going on. Now, she mentioned that after this incident, her dad, you know, they basically told him, look, we're, 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 we'll, we'll just come back a different day. And we don't, you know, you're not a Buddhist priest or you're, you're a lay leader of the temple, so we're not gonna pick you up today. We're gonna come back for further questioning on a, uh, like tomorrow, like a different day. And they would <coughs> actually come back several times. But her dad was like, after the agents left, you know, he was talking to his wife and his 10-year-old daughter, we have, to, we have to prove our loyal, like we're not dangerous just because we're Buddhists. We're not like a threat to na national security. We're not spies or we're not engaging in sabotage. We, we're, we're Buddhists, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we're a threat. So what he did was he went and scoured the house, found anything he could find that had Japanese kanji or uh, char you know, like Chinese characters on it, anything that had made in Japan on it. And for her as a 10-year-old girl, the worst thing was he uh, collected her, it's called Hinamatsuri Ningyo, these Girls' Day dolls, and then just threw all of these items into a fire. At that time, Japanese-style bathtubs, they were fired by wood fire. And that was it was one of her, this girl's chores to build the fire for the bath. So she was doing that, but she was horrified that her dad was, well, mainly horrified at the dolls going in there. And, 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 and so that's what she related to me. And she said, her, then her dad hesitated. He had these one last set of things he was going to throw into the fire, but that he decided not to. And she'd asked him, like, what could be, you know, more important than my dolls? And he explained to her that 
that uh, he had a, a, a sutra, a, a jodaka, like a pure, pure land sutra that had been uh, handed down in his family and that he didn't feel it was right to put that in the fire. He also, as the head, the lay leader at the local Buddhist temple, had all the minutes of the board from the founding of the temple all the way up to December 41. And so he felt like this was not something, this is like community history that he couldn't just throw into the fire. And so he asked his wife to get a like a rice cracker box, tin box, and some, some other old kimono to wrap these documents in, got the backhoe out, went near the large uh, tree next to the garage and kind of in his mind like this kind of X marks the spot. He dug a hole there and buried this box with a Buddhist sutra or, or a scripture in it and this kind of history of American Buddhism uh, of his temple in, in, in California. He buried that. I'm going to come back to this story at the very end, but what I wanted to note when she told me this story was one thing that kind of went off in my head was that this was a family that knew that, you know, the Japan and the United States was at war and that loyalty was going to be questioned. And they, they, they wanted to assert that they were, you know, upstanding residents and citizens of America, but that their Buddhism was not, you know, something that they could, they could so easily erase. So they, they could burn away anything that, that linked them to Japan in a certain way, but they refused to burn away their faith. And that was one family's effort, I think, to make a claim that one could be both Buddhist and belong in America at the same time. And so a lot of what my book does, the American Sutra, it's, it's, a, it's a collection of those type of stories, of stories of people who both before, right before going into camp, during camp, and thereafter, uh, found ways to make that kind of claim that you can be both Buddhist and American at the same time. Well, no, I was, was going to do this as a quiz. I shouldn't show this thing. <coughs> Natasha mentioned uh, UC Berkeley. I'm just going to ask as a kind of pop quiz. Uh, I, I hope most people have heard, heard of that. It's you know, uni university, but it's also the name of the town. Does anybody know why Berkeley is called Berkeley? English poet. English poet. Yes. Poet, philosopher, Anglican, <coughs> bishop, George Berkeley in the British pronunciation. Uh, uh, he you know, was a, a well known to have written this poem called America. And apparently the trustees, the, uh, the regents of what would come to be known as the University of California, the first of the 10 campuses that we know today. Uh, at first they, they had a college in Oakland and then they, they were standing on what's called the Founders Rock looking over uh, to the Golden Gate, which, you know, today there's the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, uh, beyond which is the Pacific. Of course, there's no bridge at that time, but in 1868, they built this new university, but apparently to, they were trying to figure out what to call it. And one of the trustees recalled this poem called America by George Barclay. And I just want to read one stanza of it. Westward, the course of empire takes its way. The first four acts already passed. A fifth shall close the drama with the day Time's noblest offspring is the last. And there are other verses, but this idea that you know of, of manifest destiny of America as a as a land that is narrated as a history going westward, that you know uh, pioneers trail. You know, there's a reason why the Portland Trailblazers are called the Portland Trailblazers, you know, like Lewis and Clark, like this idea that. That, that the American story is a story that's about westward expansion, that's about bringing, as George Barclay kind of suggests, this uh, uh, kind of England becomes like New England, right? And, and uh, a European civilization, including Christianity, moves and goes into territories that are, at least in that point of view, devoid of civilization. <coughs> 
even religion. And so the, the expansion of America westward is this kind of thing that apparently this trustee recalled when he was looking even further westward across the Pacific uh, from where the, the university would be built. I mention this because my book opens uh, with a series of poems by not a Anglican bishop, but a Buddhist priest, a Rinzai Zen Buddhist priest called Nyogen Senzaki. And he is writing a poem about this period uh, in the spring of 1942 when uh, he is uh, uh, about to uh, be taken. He's been forcibly removed from his home uh, and he's about to be taken to one of these, I mentioned Manzanar, uh, one of the big, 10 big, uh, like they're sometimes called the war relocation, WRA camps. There's another one in Wyoming called Heart Mountain in Wyoming. And he's about to be taken there and he writes this, this poem. This morning, the winding train like a big black snake takes us as far as Wyoming. The current of Buddhist thought always runs eastward this policy may support the tendency of the teaching. Who knows? It's an interesting poem, right? Um, this phrase, the current of Buddhist thought kind of running eastward, bukyo tozen, or Buddhism and eastward advance or something like that, that it, it's based on, uh, in, you know, uh, Nihon uh, uh, Shoki and then Nihon Ryoiki later, that there's these classical Japanese uh, historical texts that, that, that talk about the kind of eastward movement of Buddhism, that it begins in India, but it goes through China and Korea and finally lands in Japan, that kind of idea on the, on the eastern edge of Asia. But this Buddhist priest is talking about going from California Forcibly, this, he's, when he says this policy, he means the U.S. Army's policy of removing Japanese Americans from their homes on the West Coast and moving them inland. And he's saying, it may support the tendency of the teachings. Who knows? In other words, I, the reason I wanted to kind of do this, George Bar Bar that poem and this poem, is that it's, it's, it's about two different visions of America. Because for Asian people who have, you know, emigrated to America over 100, you know, 60, 70 years, their American story is not west, you know, it's not about going westward. Their American story is about going to Hawaii, landing in California and Seattle and moving, you know, ever eastward. And in this case, Senzaki is saying it's not just Asian bodies that are moving over, but Asian religions that are moving eastward. So I wanted to just put that out there as a kind of like place, like a, something I'm going to come back to a couple different times in the talk about, about what this book is all about, which, which ultimately it's, it's about what is America and what, what, what does uh, it mean uh, to have multiple um, migrations from different directions. Um, uh, that, that constitutes something called America. But let me go back to what happened with my professor's wife's fa family. The reason they were so concerned right after Pearl Harbor was, was because they had heard the reports about what happened even on Pearl Harbor Day. So most people know, you know December 1941, that attack happened on a Sunday. And in Honolulu, Buddhist priests were, as usual, on Sunday mornings, they were doing services. And so they hear of the attacks. One of the people that is killed is a, is a Buddhist, uh, 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 devout Buddhist member of the U.S. military. Uh, uh, he's, he's serving in the U.S. Army, a Japanese-American person. And they start getting these reports about not only people dying from the attack, including Japanese Americans, but also uh, uh, that leaders in the Buddhist, I mean, in the Japanese American community uh, were being picked up. And the very first person picked up 
at 3 p.m. that day, even before the smoke had cleared, was Gikyo Kuchiba, the, the head Buddhist priest at the Hompa Honganji Buddhist temple in Honolulu. It's the largest temple even today. And so he was picked up. Second person picked up, a Soto Zen priest at Taiheji Temple. Third person picked up, another Buddhist priest. You'd think maybe the FBI would go after like consular officials or something, you know, but like they're going after Buddhist priests immediately. And what that indicated was that Buddhist priests were as a category of person uh, categorized by the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Army G2, and the FBI as a category of person within the Japanese American community who would be considered the highest level of national security threat to the United States. They had the, a list called the ABC list in order of danger, I guess, threat to national security, and A was the most dangerous. And so Buddhist priests were in this category of leaders that if in case of war with Japan were to be picked up. Now, you know, sometimes scholars in the past used to say like, you know, it was war hysteria that internment happened or massacre. But it couldn't really have been war hysteria. I mean, it could have been a part of the calculus later. But within hours of the attack, people are getting picked up. So what does that mean? It means that lists had and w gradations of lists had already been put together prior to the war. And in my research, what I found out and I talk about in the book is that as far back as 1937, 1938, 1939, all three Army, Navy, and uh, FBI had begun to make lists of people, had begun to put Buddhist temples under surveillance, all in anticipation that war with Japan would happen. Pearl Harbor was a surprise because all the intelligence agencies thought the Japanese Imperial Navy would attack Manila and not Pearl Harbor. But, but, but the idea that one needed to be prepared to, in, ter in terms of get going to war with Japan had been in the making for quite a few years before the so-called <laughs> surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And that uh, once, once war with Japan was declared, very swiftly, 3.30 p.m., so although Bishop Kuchiba was picked up at 3 p.m., 30 minutes later, martial law was declared. Civilian government removed, territorial government removed, and a military government in place in Hawaii. And they knew how to close down Japanese radio stations, press, pick up people, et cetera. So this is not something that came out of the blue, the first part of the Japanese internment. But I think possibly better known is what happens after February of 1942. So not the first people arrested, but what happens in February 42 is President Roosevelt on the 19th of February issues an executive order 9066. It says and establishes a Western Defense Command Zone on the west coast of the United States and says anybody living there is now subject to the Army's determination about who constitutes a threat to national security. And uh, as I mentioned, roughly 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two thirds of whom are, are, are American citizens, but over, but over two thirds of whom are Buddhist, get deemed by the US Army as a threat to national security subject to force removal. And so, People are given, usually they had between a week and 10 days. So if you can imagine, if you're a student here, or if you were a student at a college in Washington State, Oregon State, or, or, or California, <coughs> you get a notice, you have, you have one week, seven days, maybe 10 days, to report to a civil control station to be taken to some camp. You don't know where you're going, and it's indefinite. They don't give you a timeline. Like, you have to go to camp for like two years or three. You just have to go. And they tell you, you can only take what you can carry. So that's, for most people, meaning a suitcase, right? So you have to kind of go to your apartment, house, like figure out what are you gonna take and what can you possibly sell or store? That's what most people faced 
uh, in, in the spring of 1942 after that executive order uh, came out. And this time, it was not about Buddhist priests or leaders and levels of threat. Everybody went. And by everybody, I mean, for example, Colonel Carl Bendiston, one of the chief architects of this entire force removal project, he said he, he, he was at an orphanage in Los Angeles. It was an orphanage that had held a lot of these you know, Asian and especially Japanese or children without parents or mixed race Japanese children. And the director of the orphanage asked him, are these like babies or three-year-olds or five-year-olds, are they also subject to Executive Order 906? Are they also to be considered a threat to national security? And he said, if they have a single drop of Japanese blood in them, I want them in camp. That's his quote. So that was a totalistic removal of an of a entire community. It didn't matter if you were a baby or an infirm grandmother, you were going to go to camp. All right? So that's what happened. And in his 1943 final report, Lieutenant General John DeWitt, the head of the fourth, the head of the, per the person controlling the Western Defense Command Zone, wrote a report in which he justified the forced removal of all these people, saying that, and this is his words, it's because of their customs, uh, uh, traditions, uh, race, and religion. All right. So in other words, the fact that this community was majority Buddhist was a factor in the thinking of these officials that these people can't be trusted. Just like my professor's wife's family also felt that when the FBI came to visit uh, them. The fact that they were Buddhist seemed to be um, uh, playing into why they seemed to be considered a threat or disloyal to America. So they went to places initially like this. Uh, this is a few miles south of uh, Seattle, the uh, Puyallup Assembly Center. They, they euphemistically call these places assembly centers, former fairgrounds, former racetracks. And one of the first indications about <coughs> how they would need to uh, consider themselves when they first went into these camps was that they had to go through a process where they look through your suitcase to see, make sure you didn't have any contraband. And the army policy said that if you have anything written in Japanese, like in terms of a book, a published text, like it could be a Buddhist scripture, it could be even like a book of poetry or something, that was considered subversive, dangerous, and contraband to be confiscated from you. <coughs> the only two exceptions was if you had an English-Japanese dictionary, that was okay. And the other exception was if you had a Christian Bible, but translated into Japanese, that was okay. So one of the things I talk about in the book a lot is this idea of, I sometimes call it Anglo-Protestant normativity, but this idea that Anglo both in the sense of whiteness, but also in the sense of kind of English only, but that there was a kind of understood norm of what it meant to be a kind of loyal American. And so the idea was that if you can't racially assimilate into whiteness, at least become Christian. That was the kind of bar that was set for them. And so Buddhists felt this, this uh, uh, clear message from the government that they didn't belong, that they weren't a part of what could be even conceived of as, uh, as American. But take a look at this photo. This is at the Livestock uh, Expo Center in Portland, Oregon. And here you see you know, this family clearly prepared because they had sheets and they had, uh, and they brought with them what they could in their suitcase. This was the family of Reverend Tansai Terakawa, who was the head of uh, a temple in Portland called the Oregon Buddhist Church. And that's his daughter, um, uh, Hiroko uh, Tera, uh, uh, Terakawa, and, and uh, playing uh, checkers with her friend Lillian Hayashi. Inside one of these, what were not many few weeks ago, a horse stall. And they had tried to, you know, beautify it, try to make it a place that was dignified. But also, if you notice, there's a Buddha, like a photo on the, uh, hung on the wall next to a large American flag. 
So for this family, even if the army had this contraband policy, even if they were told you don't belong, they claimed a place in America by saying, we can be both Buddhist and American at the same time. I'm going to move, very, I'm, I'm not keeping track of time, where, where are we at? Okay, I'm going to try to move this quickly. So one of the things that people did once they got to camp was, if you can imagine, if you've lost everything in terms of your business or your life's been disrupted, you're out of college or whatever, you're, you're, you, you have worked so hard in the year, years before the war and, and uh, you don't know what's going to happen to you, how long you're going to be in these places that were often, you know, in the remote interiors, in desert-like environments, very hot during the day, very cold at night. These par tar paper barracks built very hastily with holes in them. So it's kind of like just a harsh environment to live in. People were feeling dislocated. People were feeling loss and uncertainty. And in that time, the idea of kind of somehow recreating normalcy, recreating life, recreating uh, something that would give meaning and direction. People, unsurprisingly, uh, turned to their faith. If you're a Christian, to their Christian faith. If they're Buddhist, and because the majority of that community was Buddhist, they turned to their Buddhist faith. And so they tried to recreate Buddhism in camp. And one of the things that I found really surprising, moving um, about what these people did was they kind of took whatever they could to make that Buddhist life possible. Like one of the first big rituals in the Buddhist calendar uh, in, in the Japanese kind of tradition is called Hanamatsuri. It's usually held in April, uh, literally flower festival. Like it's the Buddhist birthday ceremony. And it's called that because according to legend, when the Buddha was born, the heavens were so happy that it rained like sweet rain, dharma rain, like, like sweet rain and flowers. And so you have this uh, little kind of like altar with flowers on it. You have a little baby Buddha and the ritual practice of the members of a Buddhist uh, a community is to pour on the Buddha's birthday the sweet tea over the baby Buddha statue. But they didn't have sweet tea. They didn't have flowers and they didn't have a statue. So what did they do? They did have army rationed sugar and coffee, so they made a sweet coffee drink. They had toilet paper and beets in the mess hall. And they would dye the toilet paper and make like origami, like, like out of toilet paper, like flowers. They, in one camp, one of the young Buddhist uh, uh, men that, that knew how to carve things went to the mess hall, found the largest carrot that he could find, and carved a Buddha statue out of the carrot. So poured that sweet coffee on the Buddha, the carrot Buddha. In this slide, you see other people. Uh, the Nishura family were well-known carpenters in the San Jose area. Uh, they built the San Jose Buddhist temple. They were in Heart Mountain, like Norgen Senzaki. And they built in a beautiful altar, their master craftsmen, but out of desert wood, scrap wood, whatever they could find, you know, in those days, like, fruit and vegetables were came in like cart wooden cartons and stuff. So they would use like scrap wood to make an altar, make, an make something that would allow them to practice their Buddhism. The other thing you see here, uh, ojizu, uh, they had a ration of one uh, piece of fruit per week in uh, certain camps. So peach pits, one of the people gathered these peach pits to make that which they didn't bring in that suitcase. And so it was that ultimately these people were able to practice their faith in camp. I sometimes call it the tri-faith, but it's Buddhist, Protestant, and Catholic. The, the civilian agency that took over after the army uh, for these big camps, the War Relocation Authority, they ultimately recognized that, you know, President Roosevelt had, you know, engaged the war with fascist Italy and Nazi Germany and uh, militarized Japan. Uh, based on this idea of the four freedoms. That America was fighting as a democratic country for these four uh, freedoms, one of which was religious freedom. So it seemed too, as you say, contra like problematic to deny these people that they forcibly put in these camps their religious tradition, even though 
Buddhism was not a preferred religion for the government. They recognized that the majority of people belong to that tradition. So they allowed three different buildings uh, where they would practice uh, 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 Buddhism, uh, various forms of Protestant uh, Christianity, and various forms of uh, Catholicism. And one of the things that those barrack churches did in the very early years of camp was to provide a space for funerals and memorial services. I mentioned that some of these camps were built very hastily, that the tar paper barracks were not very well built. And so in the extreme heat and the, and the, and the cold at night, those who were vulnerable, the very old uh, babies, uh, that first winter, many, many uh, members of the community passed away, and uh, they held, you can see this is a funeral for a baby in one of the camps in Minidoka, Idaho. But uh, that kind of ceremony took place uh, very with much frequency that first winter of 42 and spring of 43. I'm going to circle back to my professor's father, Reverend Nanatomi. One of the camps I mentioned, that, 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 that diary that put, you know, launched me into this project, he wrote about the making of this monument in 1943. In, in the Japanese Buddhist tradition, it's something called Obon. It's like a summer festival or rich set of rituals and festival where uh, uh, people remember and, and uh, celebrate the return of uh, ancestors for a, a short kind of period of time. And, he <coughs> and they, they celebrate that by by having Buddhist rituals, but also these kind of uh, dances, they call obon dancing. And so this photo, it's hard to read the Japanese series. It says, Manzana Bukkyokai, uh, Bon Odori, 1943, uh, August the 15th. But the day, and you can see, a lot of people are in this, this kind of large circle participating in this obon dance. But the day before is when he's standing in front of this monument built out of concrete. Now, he had performed so many, he writes about in his diary, so many funerals. And in the Buddhist tradition and Japanese way, they have this idea called Hatsubon or Nibon, this kind of first obon after somebody dies, is a particularly important one to you know, recognize that person's passing. And so he was, August 15th is usually day, you know, mid-August is usually when all this is held. He was like desperately going around barrack to barrack asking each family to donate five cents, maybe 10 cents per family uh, to build some kind of monument, something where they could build something around a cemetery for all of these people who had died and recognize them and not let them be forgotten. And so he called it the ireto. To means like a monument, uh, like a tower or monument and the ide to honor the, the, ide, the spirits the spirits of those who re passed away recently, but even the spirits of the ancestors of peop people come before. And he practiced, he writes in his diary, writing those three characters so many times because you know once you put it on concrete, you can't mess with it. So he practiced that so many times. Anyway, so that, that's, that monument, if you go to Manzanar today, it's run by the National Park Service. It's become a national monument. But uh, that monument is still there as a kind of feature. It, it kind of represents all of the 10 camps. Uh, it's one of these kind of iconic uh, monuments that was built in the camp days that's still there. OK, I'm going to, just for, for time's sake, try to wrap this up. I started today with that poem by Nyogen Senzaki. Here's a little sketch of him uh, by Estelle Ishigo. She was a Caucasian woman whose husband was Japanese, and she went into this camp with him, uh, the one in Wyoming called Heart Mountain. She was constantly sketching things, uh, goings on in the camp. And one of the things she sketched, she writes, a monk teaching Buddhism. It's uh, Nyogen Senzaki. I mentioned this idea of the eastward movement of Buddhism. He actually called his little barrack Tozen Zinkts. The kind, of like, kind of like the Zen meditation hall of the eastward transmission or eastward movement. And, and, and uh, he called it the Wyoming Zendo, the Wyoming Zen kind of practice place. And so uh, he would teach uh, 
Buddhism in camp, and uh, he would frame frame Buddhism, uh, frame I'm sorry, frame their experience of being in camp uh, through 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 Buddhism. Now, at the very end, I, I promise to come back to Mrs. Nagata, you know, the ten-year-old girl in Madera, California. I to come back to that story. They they they, they learn like most Japanese Americans, and the last poem I'm about, about to read from Nobis, right around 1945, uh, that the war is going America's way, and that the government is starting to release people from camp as long as they move you know, east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, but also, they're planning to return back to the Pacific Coast, and of course, once the war ends, uh, most Japanese Americans ended up uh, uh, going back to the Pacific Coast uh, to their former homes. They try to return to Madera, California. And at the time, like many other Japanese Americans, when they were told to go to camp, they're desperate, right? You have to sell your grocery store, or in this case, farm. They sold it for one twentieth of the market value when they had first left. But when they returned, they had hoped that the people that they had sold it to would kind of you know, let them buy it back at what they had sold it for. But the new owner said, no, you're going to have to pay market price. And of course, during the war, they hadn't, you know, earned, had, had the means to, 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 to have money to, to buy that kind of pr uh, price uh, property back. And so they, they had relatives in LA. So they thought, OK, we're going we're gonna to end up there. But the dad was like, I got to find that box, that box that we wrapped that Buddhist sutra and the, and the, and the, and the family history. We got we to gotta find that box again. But unfortunately, during the war, the new owners had also cut down all the large trees and torn down the garage. So he roughly knew the area, but he dug it, dug it in my, he never found the box. So, you know, somewhere in the soil of California is kind of Buddhist history and Buddhist teaching is kind of buried. And I wanted to end with this thought that the kind of the project of the book is to kind of like retrieve those teachings, so that history, uh, those memories uh, that have been in some sense also buried in people's minds. But I also wanted to end with um, this poem about why I ended up calling the book American Sutra. This is a poem that Senzaki first writes when he learns that he's about to be forcibly removed. And so on May 7th, 1942, he writes this poem called Parting. And he writes it to his Buddhist sangha or group in Los Angeles. It was a, it was a multi ethnic sangha. They had Latino members, white members, like, and of, but of course, all the Japanese members had to go to camp. But he's writing to the community that's left there. And he says, Thus have I heard. The army ordered all Japanese faces to be evacuated from this city, the city of Los Angeles. This homeless monk has nothing but a Japanese face. He stayed here 13 springs meditating with all faces from all parts of the world and studied the teaching of Buddha with them. Wherever he goes, he may form other groups, inviting friends of all faces, beckoning them with the empty hands of Zen. So that first line, thus have I heard, the Buddhist studies scholars will all know. It's the, it's the, it's the classical line preamble to a Buddhist sutra or a Buddhist scripture. Uh, after the Buddha died, you know, they, things hadn't been written down. So, so they had this assembly where one of the monks known for being very good with their memory, Ananda, would, was asked to kind of recite all of the teachings and, uh, of the Buddha. And he prefaced it with, thus have I heard. And <coughs> I mentioned earlier about that eastward movement thing. Seems like he always does slightly odd things. <laughs> and so he decides, OK, I'm about to enter some internment camp, but thus have I heard. He writes a poem where the teachings that might properly come from the Buddhist canon uh, in the lines that follow, thus have I heard, is replaced by lived experience his experience, the experience of those yearning for a place for Buddhism in America. He's saying, I may have a Japanese face, but 
I'm here because I want to create a community that is of all faces. And so that was his aspiration. And to me, uh, in that sense, there's a teaching in the lived experiences of what happened to the Japanese American Buddhist community. There are a community who were told, you don't belong. There were to community told, you don't deserve uh, due process or religious freedom. But there were also a community that said, due process, equality of the law, religious freedom, these constitutional ideals of America are just words on a piece of paper unless you embody them, you actualize them and live them. And so that's why I, I, I called the book American Sutra because I think there's a teaching in that, in, in, in that uh, process of families <coughs> like the Kimura family, the, the, my Professor Swice family, who, who said, you know what? I think we can be both uh, Buddhist and American at the same time. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Yes. So both at the sites themselves, uh, Minidoka, Idaho, uh, Heart Mountain, Wyoming, Manzanar, California are the best examples. Uh, some of the other camps are like the ones in Arkansas. Uh, today, I went there, you know, it, 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 they're just cotton fields. Uh, there's an old cemetery for those who died and that hasn't been disturbed, but there's been no recognition by the National Park Service to kind of create an interpretive center in the way that Manzanar, Heart Mountain, and just this past July, uh, Minidoka, Idaho, uh, is now part of the National Park System. So the sites themselves, and then institutions, for example, in Los Angeles, the Japanese American National Museum has a great collection of some of this material, you know, because otherwise it's like ephemera. It could easily have just been forgotten, right? So uh, collecting diaries, photographs, material, uh, things made in camp and so forth. Uh, these are certainly collected by that mu the National Museum as well as you know, smaller museums. The Smithsonian has a small section now at its uh, museum, National Museum of American History, uh, Wingluck Museum in, in Seattle, uh, the uh, uh, Nikki Legacy Center in Portland. So different cities have different uh, places that either acquire this kind of historical material from an Asian American point of view or from, in the case of the Smithsonian, uh, an interest that this is actually part of American history more broadly. Great question. So uh, it, in the book, I talk a, the, a little bit about both tensions and cooperation. So sometimes, if you can imagine, the, it, 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 there were uh, these tensions sometimes within the Japanese American community about whether to cooperate with the American authorities or whether to protest it. And Buddhists tended to be on the protested side of things, and Christians tended to be on the cooperate side of things. And so sometimes it had less to do with religion per se, but just that divide of like, I think most Japanese American Christians probably had more co-religionists, fellow religionists of other faiths back then. I mentioned Senzaki had a multi-ethnic temple, Buddhist temple, but not all Buddhist temples were like that. Sometimes they were really just 100%, you know, uh, kind of ethnic temples. Christians tended to have a little bit more of that sideways, uh, cross-ethnic connection. And so I think the tendency to want to uh, uh, not, you know, but, but th that, that said, there were certainly, you know, if you think about the Supreme Court cases like Korematsu, uh, these other, they were all Quaker, you know, like uh, 
Uh, there were the, uh, Hirabayashi she was a Quaker. You know, the, the, uh, the, that there were also Christians that also protested what the government was doing. And so sometimes that was a tension. But just to give you an example of the interfaith cooperation, that monument I showed at Manzanar today, you know, Reverend Shinjo Nagatomi, he knew that even though he did the majority of all those funerals and, you know, for the people, he knew that there, some of those babies and some of those elderly grandmothers and grandfathers were Christian and that he had friends in the Protestant, especially uh, uh, pastors who uh, were in the Japanese, Methodist, Presbyterian, and Baptist uh, churches, also Holiness Church and Salvation Army uh, people as well. But, but he, he, knew, he knew them. And, and so one of the things he did was he said, look, this is a really has to be an interfaith monument for all of those who died. It's not just a, it, yes, it's going to be placed in the context of this Buddhist summer ancestral thing called Obon, but the design of it was done by Ryodo Kazo, a Catholic architect who built several uh, Japanese Catholic churches in the Southern California area. And when they dedicated it that day, when they were out there trying to dedicate it, uh, he asked one of the Protestant uh, ministers to come and co-dedicate it with him. And so the legacy of that continues today. Every year in April, there's an annual Manzanar pilgrimage. People go, and uh, I was there this past one too. I gave a talk there. Um, I think 1,500 people went uh, in April. And um, always, I mean, there's a program. I, I was one of the speakers, like people speak. And whatever, but the most solemn part of it is an interfaith service that takes place there, uh, Buddhist and Christian. Mm. Yeah. Were there any non-Japanese Buddhists? So, um, uh, in terms of those who were inside camp, I mentioned that sketch person that did the sketch. Most people who were not Japanese who were in camp. Uh, th there's about several. Uh, th the best guesses are between 300 and 400 uh, families. Uh, that were multiracial, uh, where if the kids were of a certain age, you know, usually it was a Japanese man and Mexican or Caucasian or black, like woman, that pairing was most common. And if the kids were young, they went in together as a family. If the kids were already older, you s sometimes the non-Japanese parents didn't go in. Okay, so that's one thing just to give you on, on kind of like non-Japanese Americans who are in camp. Buddhists um, who were, let's say, Reverend Julius Goldwater in Los Angeles, Reverend Sunya Pratt up in Tacoma and Seattle Buddhist temple. Um, you know, they were not Japanese, so they were not subject to Executive Order 9066. So they didn't obviously need to go into camp, but they made tremendous efforts to both deal with helping the community store everything, safeguard the temples, made dozens of round trips to these camps to take people. So, you know, they left something, uh, you know, in that rush to get to camp. They had hoped to take something from. They would they would be so helpful to uh, uh, the Japanese Americans, and several Christian ministers, Reverend Emory Andrews up in Seattle. Baptist Church, um, Father Tivisar, the Catholic priest uh, at the at the Japanese uh, 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 members of the Catholic tradition in, in Seattle, they were also making trips as well. So, uh, I guess there were no none of these priests lived inside camp, but both Christian and Buddhist leaders who were not Japanese, and of course with the Buddhists, there's far fewer of them, uh, but they were uh, very helpful and many of them ultimately like set up in the town right outside the barbed wire, they set up a, a base from which to be helpful. Yes? Can you talk about how your work has impacted Japanese Americans today? Hmm. I don't know exactly how it's impact. You know, how much time do I have? 
can it? Okay. Can, can I? I'm going to tell then a little bit. I'll try to answer your question, but in a little bit uh, different way. Um, oops. Um, if I may, I'd like to show you um, a photo of um, this is this is one of those. You never know how your book is going to be received or uh, taken. And um, so I don't know if you can see that somebody made color photocopies of the front, like front cover of my book, and then folded, like in origami style, some cranes. All right. So this is Japanese American. I'm trying to answer quite like this is one example of a Japanese American person who, unbeknownst to me, decided to fold some cranes out of the cover of my book because somehow it related to something she was doing, which was organizing a protest in Dilly, Texas. And Dilly, Texas is the site of a, a facility called the South Texas Family Residential Center. It's about 2,700, mainly children, separated from their families, but also some women who have been part of these Central American migrants coming up from the, the, the southern border into the United States seeking refuge and asylum. And these kids have been, you know, as part of the kind of zero tolerance policy and a kind of like administration's uh, efforts to kind of deter caravans and immigration. So, so these kids have been separated from their families. And so this one group called Tsuru for Solidarity. Tsuru in Japanese means cranes. So they, they decided that they would, because the site in Dili, Texas was very close to a Japanese American World War II internment camp called Crystal City. It's one of the smaller camps that not as well known, but some of the old members who were kids back then, they were like, we were kids back when we were put behind barbed wire and detained without you know, due process or whatever. These kids are trying to seek asylum, you know, their family trying to seek asylum. They're not being given to you know, <coughs> the process either. And now they're being separated from their families. And for these, you know, they're like 85, 90 years old, you know, the, these Japanese American camp survivors. And they're like, we need to stand up for these kids. And so, on the fence at Dilly, Texas, and so on the left side of, of the slide, you can see there's fencing there, and you know these American sutra cranes were a part of this crane making project. In in Japanese, you know, tradition around Hiroshima, there's like the making of thousand cranes to make a prayer or wish for a better, more peaceful, more just future. They were they were thinking of that kind of practice when they went to Dilly, Texas, this small group, it's like 15 people, put a call out to all these Japanese American kind of groups and, and said, we want to make cranes and we want to show these kids that somebody, like back then in World War II, nobody, you know, I mentioned the few priests that helped out, but there was no politician, there was no newspaper editorials, there was no, nobody stood up for Japanese Americans back then, so we're going to stand up for these people. They're so old, <laughs> they're like 89, like, but they were like furiously making cranes. And they asked other people to do it, and, and, and they, made, they made a call for 10,000, it was a kind of very ambitious thing, like 10,000 cranes. 25,000 cranes poured in, including some of, in San Francisco, they made cranes out of American Sutra you know, <laughs> cover. So I was like, I bet. I better, I better get involved. And so after that, I'm gonna, so I, I went to, uh, uh, that, was, that was back in March. And then in June, the Trump administration announced that they were going to move 1,400 of these kids to a facility uh, at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is today a U.S. Army base. Uh, but back then, World War II was also an Army, you know, it's, it's where Geronimo is buried and it's kind of like the Apache people were forcibly removed there and boarding school, all that kind of, there's a long history at Fort Sill. But during World War II, it was again, slightly lesser known, only 700 Japanese uh, 
uh, uh, were there during World War II, but 90 of them, Fort Sill was an internment camp that had held 90 Buddhist priests. So I felt compelled, like once the administration announced they're gonna move some kids directly into a former space that was an internment camp, I, I felt moved to, to participate. So you can see me, I'm in my robes there, uh, uh, part, of, part of the, part of the uh, a protest there. And again, these uh, you know, 80 some year olds, uh, uh, almost 90 year olds were also part of that thing. And then there was a second version of it where I did the organizing, I put a call out to Buddhist communities around the country saying, I want to ask all of you to support this thing. We had you know, 90 Buddhist priests in this location back in World War II. And uh, we also had three people who were died in that place and people had forgotten these people. And two of them were killed by guards near the fence. So I was like, I want to organize like a Buddhist service, but also protest at that fence so that that doesn't repeat. So that we also are praying for the migrant kids as well as the guards that will be guarding them so that they don't shoot or otherwise m mistreat these young children. And so I put a, a call out. I got 5,000 cranes. <laughs> Uh, in a period of about two and a half weeks. And I went, and then about 25 Buddhist priests joined me. I, I just said, just buy a ticket, come out to Fort Sill. And then 25 people did that. And uh, so we marched with a group of people that primarily were Latinx dreamers. I mean, for them it was personal, it was their cousins and, uh, like, you know. And so it was this very odd, <laughs> kind of conflation of the Japanese American group, Sudo for Solidarity, making cranes, you know, this Buddhist kind of group that was now multi, also ethnic, not just Japanese American uh, temples participated. Working with these guys, they were like junior high school and high school students. And they came in all across Oklahoma, Texas, whatever, to, to be at Fort Sill. And, and we, did this, uh, we did this ceremony where we remembered those who had died in World War II. And I, I, I invited the kids to write the names of people that they know in that process of forced removal, deportation, incarceration, uh, to, 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 to remember them in this Buddhist ritual as well. So we, we did this kind of little bit odd uh, practice then, but, but, um, but that's one, how should we say, effect or one way in which some Japanese American people have been setting up these little book clubs at the temples and Japanese American community centers and reading this book because although the Japanese American World War II experience is one of the, it's a fairly well-researched area, lots of books, memoir, like everything, but this Buddhism part has been missing in this story. And, um, and so I think people have been kind of keen on kind of reading about it and then seeing how that incarceration happened because of both race and religion back then. And in thinking about who are we as Americans today, who belongs, who's included, who's excluded, you know, whether it's on the southern border around race, you know, it recalls like yellow peril and, you know, hordes of Asians invading, like, that kind of and Chinese Exclusion Act, 20, 1924 immigration, leading to in term that, that, that they know that history. They also know, you know, with travel bans around major, majority Muslim countries that when Trump talked about, you know, uh, a complete shutdown of, of Muslims coming to America, that they understood how, you know, the, I think this particular community understood how uh, both race and religion have been you know, prisms from which to, 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 to denote who belongs and who's, who's excluded. And so I think that's maybe why um, uh, some of these activities are going on uh, between Japanese Americans and other uh, kind of interlinked ethnic groups. <laughs>
be a good note to, okay. to end on. Um, if there are no further questions, because uh, you brought us really to the present and the way that this work right in here. So thank you again. For okay. Thank you.